Welcome, everyone. I'm Alejandra Bravo, Director of Leadership and Training at the Broadbent Institute, and I want to uh, introduce Building Power to Achieve a More Just Future. Uh, this is a session about how progressive movements uh, win and shape a better future for all of us. And I'm excited to welcome this group of global activists to share um, their campaign and movement building stories. In Canada, we have Carolina Jimenez, a community organizer, health professional, and the coordinator of Decent Work and Health Network, which has been championing pay, uh, paid sick days. Uh, Syed Hassan is the executive director of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and member of Migrant Rights Network, building a migrant-led democratic working class movement. And our global guest, we're very pleased to have you, Delaha Burkhardt, a member of European Parliament in Germany. Um, welcome everyone. I, I just wanna start by inviting each of you to tell us a bit more about yourselves and your organizing. Why don't we start with you, uh, Carolina, then we'll go to Hassan and then Delaha. Carolina? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thanks so much for welcoming um, me here today. So I'm a registered nurse and a public health professional. And one of the biggest things that keeps me up at night is knowing that workers and my patients are being exploited uh, under capitalism. And I know that that sounds really big picture. Um, but really, what I think about is what is my responsibility as a registered nurse, um, as a public health professional to take care of my patients beyond the primary care setting. We know that social determinants of health are huge. So I definitely feel a responsibility to my patients. And um, part of the way that I do that work is by participating in the Decent Work and Health Network, um, who really looks at work as a social determinant of health and does advocacy to try to improve the employment standards for all workers so that um, so, so that they're able to have a, a better quality of life. Um, and a couple of things come to mind when I think about decent work and health and, and my role um, is for example you know that during the COVID-19 pandemic um, as few as 10% of uh, frontline workers um, low-income workers had paid sick days and black workers were considered twice as likely um, to be considered low income um, so we can see here the clear intersection between decent work between health um, and that those are some of the guiding principles that sort of guide my work um, in advocating for for decent work or and improved working conditions Thank you, Carolina and Alejandro. Um, thinking on the same question, you know, what keeps me up at night? I mean, right now, one of the things that I think is keeping all of us up at night is what's happening in Palestine and uh, the ongoing uh, project of aggression and genocide that has been taking place there. Uh, and at the same time, those of us in Canada have been waking up every day to the news of, you know, this mass grave of 215 children uh, who were buried in a residential school. And in all of these days, the only thing we're seeing from the Canadian government is a lowering of flags rather than actually dealing with the question of uh, the state complicity uh, in the murder of Indigenous children. And that brings me closer to home because that again is about death. You know, uh, we just passed the one year mark of the first farm worker who died in a farm of COVID-19 in Canada uh, just two days ago. And since then, 10 other migrant workers have died. And um, that's really what keeps me up at night is this constant struggle with life and death between grief uh, and the struggle to organize. And so our way in terms of this grief, this, these, uh, is this human rights catastrophe that has been happening during COVID-19, uh, but has been exacerbated in COVID-19, predates that for a long time, is the treatment uh, of an exclusion and exploitation of migrants. Uh, I think it's really crucial for people to understand that one in 23 people in the country, nearly 1.6 million people are without permanent residency rights. And permanent residency is not about whether you live or go. Uh, I mean, it is about that, but what it is also about is that permanent residency is a mechanism through which you can access rights. And so that means that without permanent residency, people don't have access to basic labor rights, even minimum wage, can't get healthcare, even in a public health pandemic, uh, can't be able to assert any rights and protections, can't be with their families, uh, can't get education, uh, and as a result are created into a permanent underclass. And that really is the struggle uh, that I am part of and that we are part of. Uh, and this struggle is led by migrants, and that's very specific for us, that we are not speaking on behalf of people, we are creating the conditions 
of collective self-organizing for working class migrants to um, act uh, locally, but also in terms of the global solidarities that are so needed uh, in this moment. Thank you, Osana. I really can connect very well to that. Um, what keeps up uh, me up at night is the fact that a crisis is, is it the pandemic or is it also cr crises like the climate crisis hits, uh, that they hit vulnerable people the most. So we, we see uh, at any crisis we are facing that there are some people suffering more than others. And um, this is something that always kept me very um, awake at night, but also um, the, the fact that the, especially those vulnerable groups, but also when I think about the future, about young people, they have less say when it comes about the political answers to those crises. And this is why I was um, starting to be a youth activist in the Social Democratic Party in Germany. And since May 2019, I am a member of the European Parliament and they're like putting now the struggles we are seeing, um, especially when it comes about representation of vulnerable people, being a young woman, being a young a woman with migration background myself, to make those struggles also visible in the parliament. So this is what uh, I do um, when uh, in the parliament. Well, you've all made a huge difference in this last year where um, the inequalities and injustices that you've um, identified have really been sharpened and exposed. And so we really wanted to invite you to tell us uh, the story of how your campaigns are achieving wins or, or changing the conversation. Um, let's start with you, Delara, and then we'll hear from Carolina and Hassan. Okay, I will try because I, I'm not like a classic civil society activist anymore. I'm a member of parliament and I'm, I'm trying to solve um, the, the, the stuff others have been messing up. So um, this is a little bit my job right now. Um, and um, well, my work in the parliament really concentrates on, on the environmental committee where I'm a member and I'm working on the so-called Green Deal, which is uh, Europe's program to be the first climate neutral continent. Um, it was actually starting before the, right before the pandemic, I think four months before, uh, the European Commission presented the Green Deal um, with a lot of different laws we want to make um, to, to change and to, to make our ecological footprint less big as European Union. And when the pandemic started, we saw a lot of industries um, trying to challenge the Green Deal, saying that now with, with the pandemic, we don't have time anymore, we don't have the resources anymore to, to solve the climate crisis and to, to implement policies that would tackle it. Um, and it was a very hard job for us progressives in the parliaments uh, all over Europe to, to make this stop and to still say, okay, we cannot ignore one crisis because there's another one uh, coming up. Um, so we have to, to challenge it uh, both together. And this is why as progressive movement, we have campaigned for the Green Deal to be the solution out of the um, of the crisis um, to, to combine the recovery we are doing with the goals of the Green Deal. For example, one big success was that we made it that there are strict climate criteria implemented in the recovery plans, but also always focusing that our actions as Europeans don't stop at our borders. We have a responsibility when it comes about human rights violations, um, environmental destruction outside our borders. We have, of course, also a um, a, a responsibility when it comes about the global fair distribution of vaccines. So it was a very much the urgency that progressives fought for that we, we have a global angle on, on tackling the crisis, be it the climate crisis or the pandemic. So uh, we made a, a first um, good progress where we, we started not to have austerity policies being set in place now, saying that um, we have to um, like um, cut public spending to get out of, this, um, of, out of the crisis. No, we have to invest in future and in the social ecological transition of our societies. So basically, um, it was our job to not be everything that we have fought for in the last uh, months um, since the European elections were uh, to be cut off again and then uh, go into a crisis mode, but to use the situation to build back better and come out of this crisis stronger than before and also see the the responsibilities we have on that on the global scale. So this would be um, the the overall view, but of course we can also go deeper in different subjects. I would like to discuss that with you. So how have you moved the conversation or had some wins in the last year, Carolina? 
Yeah, thanks, Alejandra. Um, so I think that this story is is quite unique because the way that the Decent Work and Health Network does um, our, our advocacy is based on the leadership of workers. So the story really begins with Justice for Workers and the Workers Action Center, which is um, a group of workers who are setting their vision for decent work. They reached out to the Decent Work and Health Network to health providers to try to get them to be involved in a press conference about the minimum wage so that the minimum wage would be raised. So we really have taken our direction from workers from the very beginning. We have used our social capital to support these demands, um, and we've done that in a variety of ways. So for example, when the Ford government got elected, one of the very first things that they did was cancel some of the wins that we uh, that we had gained. Um, so they got elected in 2018, and one of the first things they did was cancel um, the the rise in the minimum wage. They scrapped the two paid sick days that we worked so hard to win. So what we did to hold the government accountable was do a report, which was the first of its kind. And this report outlined principles for evidence based implementation of paid sick days. And so we found through interviewing workers, that paid sick days need to be permanent, they need to be seamlessly accessible, and they need to be for all. Um, and this set of principles really allowed us to our, continue our advocacy during the COVID-19 pandemic to say, we need this and we need this now. It allowed us during the second wave to be able to um, analyze and criticize the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit to say this is not enough. And during the third wave, we saw that our, our advocacy has really led to the implementation of new programs, um, starting off with Ontario with the Worker Income uh, Protection Benefit, which had a ripple effect uh, and has led to other provinces moving on paid sick days, which includes BC, Nova Scotia, uh, Manitoba. And so we're at the point now where we can continue to use that research, that report that we created to say this is a step in the right direction, but it's certainly not enough. Workers have been uh, putting their lives on the line and it's really um, not fair for them to receive as little as, as three paid sick days here in Ontario. Um, and then the range for the amount of days that have happened in all the different programs is three to five. Again, these programs are temporary. They were going to be, um, you know, ripped off before the end of the year. Uh, you know, one in July, uh, the one in Ontario in September, the one in BC um, before the end of the year. And so we're continuing to, again, uplift worker voices, use our social capital and leverage our voices um, to use the evidence and to hold the government accountable for some pretty uh, reckless policy decisions that continue to, to harm uh, our patients, our colleagues, um, and in particular, just proportionately um, hurt uh, black and racialized communities. Um, so it's really it's really exciting to see that um, our research, our report was able to create um, this pressure to get governments to act. Um, and again, none of this work would have been possible um, without workers themselves organizing um, uh, and, and we're super happy to continue uh, to be supporting uh, the Justice for Workers calls. Um, you know, we know that paid sick days is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Like there are so many other facets of decent work that are important. So uh, our work definitely continues. Hassan, you've also moved the needle quite a lot in the last year when it comes to the issues of justice. Why don't you tell us uh, the story of what's been happening with the campaigning and the movement building? Mm -hmm. If we go back to, you know, March 2020, uh, on March 15, 2020, before Canada declared it, before the World Health Organization issued its statement, we wrote a letter to the Rights Network, which is the only uh, national body of self-organized migrants, uh, laying out the human rights catastrophe that was to follow. And what we saw was that this incredible... Um, attack that took place uh, on our rights, not by the pandemic, but by the exclusions that were accompanied in it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you are in a place where speaking up against a bad boss or difficult conditions can make you, uh, when you make it so that you'll be fired, uh, not only will you be fired, uh, you're not allowed to get another job because you're an employer dependent work permit. Uh, you're not able to, you're now homeless because you live in employer provided housing and then you are uh, not able to get another job, um, you are then forced out of the country because you're on a work permit and then you can't come back because the employer controls 
whether you are able to come back. Then in such a situation, when there's such an incredible power imbalance, how can people organize? And when I mention you know, 1.6 million people, we've got half a million people who are undocumented in this country, another half a million on study permits, 100,000 uh, in farm work and in domestic work, uh, and you know, refugee claimants, uh, as well as people in other industries. So there's this huge number of people, it's one in 23 nationally, but so much bigger in urban centers, who are excluded from all of these rights and protections. But in this moment of challenge, migrants organized. We saw the formation of uh, chapters at farms, we call them base groups. We saw domestic workers organizing in uh, online. Uh, or we saw international students creating chapters at campuses and off campuses and in cities uh, and taking dozens and dozens of actions. I mean, every week we hear where you know, farm, work, farm workers are told you have to work harder because there are fewer workers or, or their housing conditions are substandard and inhumane and workers self-organizing, marching on the boss, uh, issuing statements, uh, refusing work. Uh, we see the same with domestic workers. So we've seen this incredible amount of organizing that has responded to the crisis. And while we're doing this in our organization, we have, as I mentioned, uh, linked with the Migrant Rights Network. Uh, and initially, you know, our call was we want COVID-19 testing. We want access to federal income supports, which were provided to other people, but not to people without um, a valid social insurance number. We want labor protections. Uh, and as migrants were making this call, it became clearer and clearer that we needed something far more uh, holistic and comprehensive because we couldn't be fighting for, like we are today, fighting for vaccine access in 13 provinces and territories. We needed one single reform. Uh, and between April and May of 2020, over 4,000 migrant undocumented people held meetings across the country despite COVID, despite the lack of, you know, internet access or phone access with different levels of literacy, people speaking dozens of different languages, and identified that the call had to be full and permanent immigration status for all. Simply everyone in the country must have the same status. Now, this is not, this is a very crucial point. You cannot have a fair society without equal rights. And you cannot have equal rights when one in 23 people have different immigration status. Migrants understand that, they've identified this as the demand, and they've moved. So between March, um, sorry, between June of 2020 and now June of 2021, we have seen you know, over 50 demonstrations, protest actions in dozens of cities across the country organized by migrants who are unmasked, even though marching in the streets can mean detention and deportation. Uh, and as a result, we've seen some major wins. Um, including you know, stopping a mass deportation of 52,000 international students this January, uh, the creation of uh, pro programs such as the recent um, immigration program for 90,000 essential workers, the changes in vaccine rules, making it easier for people to access, etc. But these remain minor changes. The full and permanent solution that is needed right now is to fundamentally rewrite what it means to be what our immigration system has to be. You know, for the last 20 years, we've seen not just in Canada, but the United States across Europe, this switch to temporary migration, where most people enter the country without permanent resident status and therefore without rights. It's one in 23 today. At this rate, it'll be one in 13 in just, you know, seven years. And then it'll be like one in uh, eight very soon after, because it is an exponential growth in a shift towards temporariness. And that has reshaped everything. You know, our universities, our healthcare system are now relying on, as well as employers, of course, are choosing to uh, create a business model that requires a far more exploitable workforce instead of people. And we have to rewrite, and migrants understand that and see this as part of a global um, uh, process and are calling for full and permanent immigration status for all. So we are continuing that fight. We see every day. Uh, that people are taking action despite the challenges, despite the human rights catastrophe and winning. Thank you. Um, and Delara, I'm going to go to you first with this next question, um, and I'll be asking each of you in turn, what are the big barriers to making the kind of ambitious transformations that you're all aiming, whether it's climate justice, worker justice, or migrant, ju migrant justice? Delara, how do you see the big barriers in your context? I mean, um, one is um, connected to the question why I, why I said I why I'm wake, uh, I'm wide awake at night is because a lot of people who whose voice should be heard in su in such questions they don't have a voice in the political process and we know that um, um, 
the problem is that we have political majorities in Europe, but also um, in, in other places in the world where um, conservative parties are very much loyal to, to lobbyists when it comes to the industry. But um, if there are civil society movements, the, the wishes and the demands from those are often not heard in the process. So one big barrier is that we don't have progressive majorities yet and we have to mobilize for them. The other one would be um, to, to also mobilize this um, demand for, for change in the civil society because I can understand the frustration. I, I also see um, after being uh, in the parliament for for two, year, uh, two years now and one of my topics of my heart is uh, the, 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 uh, how we can implement a more um, humane migration policy in Europe and we saw in the crisis that especially in the uh, in, in the in the refugee camps outside the borders of of, um, of Europe, we where we had a very severe situation where a lot of people all over Europe stood up and um, were doing the hashtag leave no one behind, um, heavy, um, demanding that politicians should have an eye on that and also should provide solutions on how refugee camps can be um, secured and um, protected um, from the COVID uh, virus in, in the pandemic. And still, until now, we don't have any reactions on that as there is a conservative majority in, um, in the European institutions that is blocking the change that is needed. So I, um, I can understand why there's frustration also in building up civil society movements. When you get a majority, if you have a lot of public support, still there's no action needed. So this balance between stopping blocking um, the block of progressive majorities, but also having the movement continue and demanding for progressive change, this is kind of the challenge we are facing here. Great, thank you. And Hassan, how do you see the barriers or what barriers are you experimenting in, in terms of the big sort of ch transformations that you're looking for? Crucially, you know, what we need is organized working class movements. And we simply uh, have not organized our entire sector. You know, we see ourselves as organizing the migrant sector of the working class, which is 1.6 million people in this country. But we also need to organize all of our people. Uh, not just in Canada, but around the world. Uh, that means stronger unions, democratic membership-based organizations, uh, and coalitions and coordinating bodies uh, that bring them together in a united front. That is the real uh, challenge is, our, is that we've, is we've lost our organizing capacity. You know, you know we always say um, they have the power, you know, they have money, uh, but we are the many. Uh, but we are only the many as powerful as we are organized. Our power comes from our forming institutions uh, and i think that a lot of our work has been to not create democratic membership based you know not just email strings or not just campaigns or one-offs but organizations uh, that are building up people's consciousness uh, the second barrier is you know exactly as Dilara just said we are seeing this uh, hegemony of the right the conservative right uh, the the close coordination between uh, the super rich and many political parties uh, where it is the interests of those lobbies that are really uh, setting the agenda. And the, uh, and the necessity of us creating uh, a place of our own institutions that challenge those ideas uh, and their power. Uh, and when I, when I say that specifically, you know, in the context of Canada, we need our own um, institutions of media, we need our own institutions of uh, unionizations, we need our own institutions of collective struggle, and uh, by and large we've not been able to build them. Uh, and the other side has uh, been extremely successful with far fewer people to do so. Um, and, uh, and and to really sort of highlight the that in this moment, you know, we are facing a question uh, about the future. We can either uh, go out of COVID into a moment where we are going to swing right. There's going to be austerity. They're going to say, we paid for everything that we want it back. Uh, xenophobia, you know, we're going to see these huge levels of unemployment that might uh, uh, emerge post-crisis or whatever post means. And in that moment, there will be the attempt to make us fight each other at the bottom of the barrel, to fight each other. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll see our people being turned against, you know, the reason that there is austerity is because they're migrants or they're poor people or they're refugees. Uh, and we have to be very, very clear about um, the challenge that is emerging at uh, this moment that we are in and to prepare accordingly. Uh, because it's not a given that we come out of this crisis uh, in a more socially just, transformative way. 
Great. Um, Carolina, in terms of the work that you've been doing with worker rights, what do you see as barriers standing in the way, if any? Yeah, so I think that for a lot of health workers, the links that are being made between work and health still seem to be uh, very downstream. Um, for example, we spend the majority of our lives at work and so do our patients. And the evidence is very clear that work and health are inextricably linked. Um, you know, research has shown that work is one of the largest stressors in our lives and a, and a driver of social and economic uh, inequity. Um, it's also a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. Um, so I think that a lot of the work that we need to do is look at how part of our responsibility as healthcare providers, um, as people who are in public health uh, and in public policy, how do we address this um, from a, a, a macro or meso level? Um, so thinking about, you know, advocating for an improvement of wages is actually central to our ability to provide uh, health care. Uh, this also includes things like paid sick days that the Decent Work and Health Network has really been championing. This also includes, similar to what Hassan has been saying, status for all. These things are central to to health. So sometimes I find um, that, you know, health providers by no fault of our own, right, our education system doesn't really uh, prep us for this. We think about what's happening acutely with our patients and how we can fix that. And my experiences in the emergency department have, have fully taught me the same. Um, but we need to think about what are the other things um, that are impacting our, our patients' health um, and, and what can we do to really to really push, push the meter. Um, and then, you know, going off of that, I think it's also raising our expectations of what is possible. Like I said at the beginning, um, you know, governments were super reluctant to even speak about the importance of paid sick days. In the Ontario context, um, our premier said that paid sick days were a disingenuous policy. Um, they took them away as soon as they came uh, into, um, in, in, into office. But I think because of the network's ability to be able to link the medical evidence of the importance of workplace protections to health, um, we were able to show that you know these policies are life saving. Um, you know, for example, in, in Peel Region, one of the regions in Ontario that really was devastated and continues to be devastated by COVID, um, one in four people went to work with symptoms, um, with COVID nineteen symptoms. So, um, when, yeah, so for sure, the the biggest challenge is you know to try to get people to think um, a little bit more upstream to think about um, what are the different policies um, and what is our role as healthcare providers um, to do that. Um, and I think that we've come a really long way. Like like I said earlier, it's been so great to see that the government like has backtracked on saying that paid sick days were disingenuous and have put in the, the three temporary days. Um, but our fight continues to make sure that these days are permanent um, and to make sure that they are a standard part of every worker's benefits, regardless if they are a, a temp agency worker or if they are in an app platform based work, um, because that's one of the one of the ways that we can make sure um, that, you know, we're all protected. And like Dr. Teresa Tam said, um, none of us are protected until we all are. Well, clearly from your remarks, um, you know, if we're going to have justice coming out of the pandemic, we really have to grapple with this enemy on the other side, the coordination of the right. And it's lovely to hear all of you talk about the need for solidarity as a discipline across movements and within movements. And I just want to dig a little deeper into this question about movement building and um, what you're learning in doing this in this incredible time and in doing the work that you do. Um, specifically, how do you hold the tension between wanting that pragmatic immediate wins and then also looking for longer term the social and economic change that you've talked about? So I'm going to go first uh, to you, Hassan, on this one. I think we answer this question in our organization by creating space for migrants and workers themselves to debate that question and to identify the specific methods, uh, tactics, strategies, and calls. Uh, and we have seen that the level of political consciousness and coordination is very high. And so at a moment when, uh, you know, workers were dying, when people didn't have healthcare, when um, we were in the midst of this, in this continuing crisis, which had been worsened, uh, migrants decided that the call they were going to do was for full and permanent immigration status for all. Uh, 
right? Which is to say, ev to change the way in which immigration is imagined, in which rights are imagined, in which um, belonging is imagined. Uh, and at the same time, there is a very clear understanding that we can only win that which we have power for. So our ability to win long-term social and economic change is directly linked to how much power we have. Uh, and we build that power through a series of pragmatic wins that build the confidence uh, and expertise uh, of, our, of our class and our base. So people need to fight and win process learned for the next fight. Um, and so what is most uh, important is in that moment that we are, uh, that every win is about expanding our, our power, bringing more people into the struggle, uh, building up a new and newer um, levels and cadres of leadership. Uh, as well as ensuring that we don't win things that in a, in a way um, strengthens the power of the opposition or of government or of, you know, prison-based society. You know, we abolitionist, uh, feminist, collectivist, anti-racist future. Uh, and so each campaign must ask ourselves, uh, will this pragmatic win further that call? And we find that by building a democratic institution that that's possible. Uh, and, and so what we need to do right now is uh, say so that there is intention, uh, but that we must ask for it uh, and we must build the steps. So asking, but also building immediate steps towards that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Dilaka, what about you? What are you learning about movement building from your position as an elected official? And you must, uh, you must often have to think about a pragmatic step now towards something bigger in the future. Tell us. Uh, definitely something I, I had to, to learn in the last two years. It's my first time being an um, elected official. So uh, I had to learn that sometimes you have to be pragmatic and to find compromises, even if they hurt you sometimes. But the question is how you keep um, the, the context and how you keep um, 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 how you keep movements organized and not be frustrated by compromises you are doing. So. What, um, what I think what is very good, what um, my youth movement in the party always did and what I try to also keep alive while I'm a member of European Parliament is that um, we have to, to have like bridges between parties and civil society movements because um, they, have, um, they have to be brought to the parliaments, to the decision making and they have to be MEPs who are part of those movements. And for example, I, I'm a unionist myself and um, I also was um, active in youth movements a lot. So I try to be this bridge and I always come back if we make decisions and discuss them with the movements that also support my political agenda. But sometimes we have the situation that um, there, there, there is this, this bridges don't function anymore. And I think it's crucial that, that parties don't um, um, work on a on a like level where they they are not attached to any movement at all. They have to always build back those bridges. And um, in the youth movement, we call this the double strategy that we combine our activism on the streets and in the civil society with the job with the work we are doing in the parliament. So there is always the tension. And sometimes you have to, in a democracy um, being a lefty in a parliament where you have not left majorities, you you have to um, always try to fight the little steps, but don't forget the vision and also don't forget to unite uh, the movements to 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 fight for progressive change when there are elections coming up and i also see their room uh, for for change and um, a more um, um solidaric and um, combined um, progressive movement in, in for example the german elections that are coming up and i, I kind of uh, am afraid that this is not the case right now um, we have a very strong green party which wouldn't have a problem to govern for example with the conservatives my party did that and i can not re recommend that if you want to do progressive change so we uh, we have a very difficult situation in a multi-party system uh, to to organize those majorities when it's always about having opposition and government and also uh, criticizing let the opposition of course criticize um the government so it's um a little bit uh, difficult sometimes to distinguish between um, compromises you make in the government and um, what you what you want and what you fight for in your civil society movement and this is a tension I I feel on a daily daily level but I try to to overcome it with um, staying close to the movements I want to represent in the parliament. Yeah, I think it's uh, really worth lifting up this idea of the double strategy the inside champions um, working with um, movements on the street and keeping uh, real. Um, like a, a site on the fact that it requires both. Um, Carolina, I wanted to ask you about something you mentioned before and dig a little deeper into the, you know, so we can see how this 
a movement is being built right now in Canada. Um, so you mentioned that uh, new conservative government in Ontario, we lose the paid sick days uh, promise, um, but then this pandemic happens and all of a sudden this is uh, a demand that's, you know, resonating across Canada. Can you tell us more about about that situation in that moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that this also builds off of the, the question that you asked about the tension between um, pragmatic wins and long term um, transformations. And uh, I don't see like and I'm going to have to agree with Hassan, like I don't I don't see there as being the tension. Like I think that the pragmatic wins are necessary um, for the longer term, like social and economic transformation. Um, and in my work, I always give pause to think about what a win meant means and for example when um, the ford government came in and scrapped the two paid sick days that we had at that point 77 percent of ontarians supported paid sick days but there was still a lot of work to be done to change the public discourse and i feel like that's one of the things that um you know because of the the very strong base that Justice for Workers and the Workers Action has, Center has already built, the Decent Work and Health Network has, has been able to, to lend our voice to that and to make sure that instead of focusing specifically on the legislative wins, we're working on changing the discourse. So this meant for us a lot of it, um, you know, after they scrapped away the paid sick days, we went back to talk to workers to assess what losing the two paid sick days meant for their health. And as we were doing this, COVID-19 uh, started. And so we pulled the evidence from what we've learned from other outbreaks with the relationship between paid sick days and, and um, you know, the uh, H1N1, paid sick days and flu outbreaks. Um, we were able to get that qualitative research, the quantitative research, and then build that out throughout the pandemic to position paid sick days as an urgent, um, issue that workers need these essential protections to protect not only themselves at work, but to also prevent from the catastrophic downstream effects that we've seen, which is um, over capacities in, in ICUs, um, the, the, the death and the undue burden on black and racialized communities. So um, through that, we were able to leverage um, folks on a individual level. So we did a lot of work with our colleagues. We also did a lot of work with public health. We wrote and and presented reports to, um, you know, medical officers uh, of health. Um, we were able to work with municipalities to get them to support uh, paid sick days, um, and all of this built so that it reached the breaking point where we were able to change the public discourse to hold the government accountable and to make them feel like their decision. Um, was at risk of them, uh, you know, losing favor. And that's exactly what happened. And like, I think the really beautiful thing that we didn't expect was that our advocacy and our ability to really build from the ground up, um, to really lead with the worker voice, as we've heard um, Hassan explain uh, today, has really led to a position where now we're gonna use that when the uh, different governments try to take away the paid sick days that we've won. I think in British Columbia, it's a little bit different because they um, have, you know, uh, promised that there's going to be a permanent amount of days. But I think that um, the fight continues um, because exactly like what's going to happen when the provincial government in Ontario decides to take away the paid sick days in September. We're going to mobilize the base um, and we're going to say, you know what, like paid sick days are essential to um, a recovery. They're essential for people who um, need to go to medical appointments and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's been really great to see that the the work that's been done here that's been happening for decades prior to even the decent work and health network coming together um is uh is really coming to to fruition well it's great to uh to hear from all of you um how much you value material wins and how much organizing needs that the the stretch uh, between um, what we know is possible and where we are now and when people come together and develop strategy together and the people you've all talked about the people most impacted being part of the decision making process um, and that's how we build power so that that was a, a great round and, and just with the last question I just want to ask you um, what's possible now that you wasn't possible before in, in your mind. So let's, let's end on a, like what's our most radical imaginations. What do you, what do you think that we can 
deliver on or build now that we couldn't build before? I'm, I'm going to go back to you, Carolina, first. Yeah, thanks, Alejandra. Um, I think that it is centering decent work as part of a COVID-19 uh, just recovery. I think that before the links between work and health weren't as clear. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has expedited that. Um, but I think that it allows us the ability to center the impact of work on health and to make sure um, that we are advocating for improved protections. Like I said, paid sick days is just the tip of the iceberg. We need things like status for all, protections for temp agency workers. We need an end to the racism and discrimination um, at work. We need an increase in the minimum wage. And these two things are linked not only to um, a, a, a better future for us all after COVID, um, but uh, linked to the uh, the, the current health impacts that people are seeing now. And I don't think that if it wasn't for COVID, I think that it would have taken us much longer um, to, to, to get to thinking there. Hassan, the last word on what you think is, is possible and, and what you hope mm -hmm. for now. I think I want to remind all of us that the moment that we came out of the COVID-19 uh, crisis with these global mass protests was when the you know, Black Liberation Movement first in the United States and around the world took to the streets. Uh, and that now we have this moment where prison abolition, uh, you know, defunding of the police is an actual real conversation and it is moving ahead. Uh, I, I, wanna, I believe that you know, in this moment that we've seen that Palestine will be free and it will be made free by Palestinians. Uh, I believe that there is a moment right now where Canada is coming uh, to terms with the fact that it is a settler colony. Uh, and that the government and the laws that are here are made um, by a you know by the colonizer and you know sometimes and not sometimes and that there are mass graves of children hidden away across the country that need to be uh, um, contented with. Uh, I believe that you know full and permanent immigration status for all is possible uh, and pragmatic and necessary and is around the corner. You know I think that um, you know as uh, Delara mentioned like a green deal. Uh, you know, rebuilding our society in a way that is just uh, not just for, you know, one place in the world, but a global green deal where all of us have uh, are able to survive the climate catastrophe. Uh, all of this is possible. And I think it's definitely uh, within reach, uh, having said earlier that we are at a, at a turning point. We can build our power, organize, unite, move forward. Uh, these are within our grasp. You know, the future is in our grasp uh, and we have to take it. Excellent. Delara, as someone who's in elected office, but comes from movements and has connections on the street um, with a, a generation that's more ambitious than other generations before, um, what do you see as possible or, or what do you imagine um, can happen now that couldn't happen before? I mean, I think there were some things uncomfortable to, to see some, for some people that those injustices we have seen in the pandemic coming up and some were shocked that they are, even exist when it comes to the situation of healthcare workers, when it comes to the situation of refugees in the camps, they were there before. Those injustices have been there before, but right now we have them on the, on the table um, and you, they are much more visible. And so there's a public awareness that is going bigger, more movements that have already been mentioned that put those injustices in their core. And what we need, and I think Hussein said it in the very beginning, um, we need them to be institutionalized, to be them more organized, to, to keep up the pressure that is now there on the table. So uh, this is what, um, of course, also hurts to see, but also is a is a um, important step for progressive change um, to, to have those visibility of those injustices. Also on the global scale, when we look at Europe, for example, when the textile industry um, blocked their um, demands, um, then th thousands of people in Bangladesh were um, out of jobs and they don't have a social security net like we have in Europe. So injustice have been become more visible on a global scale and we need now to mobilize to, to make the political changes that will solve them. Well, I thank you so much, Delaha, Carolina, Hassan. Um, it gives me so much hope to hear um, not only your analysis, but the rich meaning that you're bringing to your work and the alignment. You know, we're in different parts of, of the globe, but um, we're seeing this as an opportunity for making some, 
some substantial and significant uh, transformations, not, not, not small change. So thank you very much to all three of you for participating today. Thank you.